Hi, Cynthia Allen. And I feel like I've had a first, a first row seat to watch healing recently in our Darby, Darby, our Woodle, our Darby dog. And Darby has passed us on an awful lot of wisdom in the three and a half years of his life. But I have to say that this wisdom that he's passing on about uh, to us about the process of healing after he was in a hit by a car about 11 weeks ago now. And it was a really big injury. And it's the kind of injury that many dogs would have had to have been put down for. So we feel very blessed that we had pet insurance and uh, that he has a really had a really good prognosis. And this process of watching him heal, oh my gosh, it just, I mean, I've seen it in myself. I've seen it in uh, my husband. I've seen it in clients. But there's something about being able to watch it in Darby and this other being that has made it just so much somehow easier for us. And I just want to show you a picture of him real quick so that you have that ability to see this is Darby before the accident when he could still stretch out long and splute both his legs wide. Beautiful, beautiful, lovely dog for us. And Darby has been in this process of doing something that a lot of us have had to do in our lives, which is to come back from something that's pretty catastrophic. So his left side of his pelvis was uh, shattered and broken away from the spine. So it had to be pulled down, reattached to the spine. And then uh, a lot of metal is in there now, a lot of metal is in there. And so when Darby first came home, and I think, I think you might recognize some of these stages in your own life. And I want to use his stages like as a dog. And I think it could be illustrative for you or for someone, you know, we've all had something that has happened to us that is pretty big. It could have been uh, something that we thought of as more big in terms of grief or some kind of emotional trauma, that it could be something we think of more as a physical trauma. It's of course always encompassing. It's we're not just emotions and we're not just physicality. And in that first stage, right after the initial trauma for all three of us and getting him to the, getting him transported to the hospital and getting all the ideas and getting him set up for surgery and then him having surgery, then I would say, then is when I, I'm going to start this process of chronicling. And, you know, Darby's world shrunk down, really shrunk down. Our world shrunk down. And he went inside himself almost as if nothing out there else existed. And the most that he really could do was express himself through light crying or whimpering. This was his sign that I'm suffering. I need you to know I'm suffering, I'm suffering. And then about two or three days into the healing, he let out a single, Oof. he heard something, I think on the porch and he was able to give out one woof. That's all he could do. He couldn't do more than that. But you realize, ah, there's something of him coming back. And then a few more days go by and now he's able to get up and he's able to go outside with help, with us holding his hindquarters in the air so that they don't just fall everywhere and eliminate outdoors. He's able to pee. He's able to defecate. If I can hold his haunches for him and get him in the right position, he's able to defecate. And still, he's pretty internal, right? Not really eating much. He's not licking on us. He's not really interacting with us. And then we hear one day a single bark. Oh, not energy for more than one bark. It was like the one wolf, but he has a single bark that he can make. He begins to take a little treat maybe here or there. When we go outside, this is probably about week three, I would say, that we go outside in the backyard for him to 
do his business, he starts to ask to go out the front gate, go out the gate to the front yard. He wants to know what else exists. He begins to realize his life is starting to expand again a little bit. In the house, even though we have him with us all the time, he begins to start to kind of try to check out the rooms of the house. Oh, I was just only in the bedroom. I was only in the living room. Does the kitchen still exist? Does the bathroom still exist? Can you open the basement door so I can look down and see what's down there? He starts to check around. And then I think it was probably about week four or five, he went into a series of barks in the house. Something, he heard the post person, on the, po the mail carrier on the porch and he went, rawr, 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 rawr. Not, not didn't get up and do anything crazy, but he just let his voice, he had enough energy to let his voice go in multiple things. So you can just see how the, the, the withdrawal to take care for the inner systems to build itself. And then this, this so gradual, so gradual, this unfolding. When we take him out to pee, he starts to sniff the air. And you realize he hasn't been sniffing the air. Now he's, he's sniffing the air. Now he's listening. He's smelling and he's listening for what's going on. This yard that for him had been his territory. And he would run back and forth many times a day to let all the other animals in the yard know this is his territory and you will not occupy it. That has not been going on, right? He's been acting like he doesn't know that there's squirrels and maybe he didn't, or that he doesn't know that there's been bunnies or rab uh, rabbits or raccoons. And then we start to take these really super short walks and he takes his pee and we notice that wherever he pees, even before this, wherever he pees, his peas are so long. Urination takes him so long. He doesn't just pee like he used to, but he pees and then he squeezes and then he squeezes and then he squeezes and he squeezes a little bit more until he cannot squeeze anything out. That's fascinating. He realizes he's not going to need to save anything for marking. He doesn't have any marking in him. All he's got is he wants to shorten up the number of times that he needs to come out and pee. Hmm. Does that sound familiar to any of you who are trying to figure out how to get up and conserve all your energy to get back to your recliner and sit or rocking chair and sit? So we go on these super short walks in the neighborhood and he um, acts like he doesn't see the other dogs at all. This dog who's always been super gregarious super oriented to other people is like they don't exist he has no interest he knows he's injured he knows he has to be careful one day he lifts up his injured leg to pee he doesn't just try to splay his legs but he lifts up his injured leg to pee and at first the first time it's like uh nope i don't think so and then the second time it's like oh i think i can Oh yeah, I can get it up there a little ways. Oh, and the third time it's like, oh, I can get it up really high. Not too long after that, he tries to lift the non-injured side, which means he has to stand on the injured side. And it, it almost immediately goes up, oh, not, not available. And he still isn't doing much with that, but he is doing more of that. He starts to ask to get up on the sofa, which we were told we couldn't do in the beginning because he might jump up then it might jump off and it takes a while but he starts to ask right we, we try to sit with him on the floor we try to make his life as normal as we can be with the fact that it's not in the same way he's used to it so he's starting to go I want to reclaim more of my other life I want to reclaim more of my former life oh then he begins to make a few marks on the walks he doesn't have to squeeze out all the urine anymore. He could leave a little bit back to let the other dogs know he's coming back. He's saying, hey, I'm, I'm starting to get better. I'm starting to get better. He goes into the backyard, still on a leash. Can't let him run yet because his legs don't work right and they still don't work right. And this is about mm, probably 
eight or nine weeks out and he barks at the squirrels with unbridled enthusiasm. He's like going to let them know, hey, I cannot come and chase you yet, but this is my yard and I'm letting you know, I'm definitely coming back. He jumps on the sofa one day when he's not supposed to be jumping and we weren't looking and we should have been looking. He tries to jump on the bed, but he hits his head halfway up and he realizes, oh, I can't do that. So then he begins to ask, can you, in his own way, can you help me get up on the bed? Can I lay on the bed with you for a little while? He begins to make all of his desires and needs more known so that we can help him accommodate and reclaim more of his life. He, uh, he has a time that he thinks we should all go to bed by. And so he begins to, to bark and say, Let's it's time, right? Let's go to bed. We all should go to bed together. His appetite starts to increase and we don't have to keep it on a leash anymore in the house. And so he starts to, he starts to increase his eating a little bit, but he claims something new for himself, which is that something he's never done is that he's gonna get up in the middle of the night and eat only one meal a day. And he's gonna eat the whole thing. And he's not going to eat two anymore. He's going to eat one. And he's going to eat the whole thing most days. He's lost a lot of weight, lost a lot of weight. So we're just glad that he's not losing weight anymore. And then the thing that we have really noticed here in week nine, 10, and 11, even though his hind legs do not work the way that we think they are going to work, we think he is going to get his nerve conduction all back that takes time and he'll be able to climb steps and go down steps using his hind legs instead of just trying to pull himself up and he'll be able to jump again because he was a jumper. Um, he's just, he feels good enough to be happy with his life as it is now. Almost his full personality has reinstated itself at this 11 ish week mark. He's happy with other people. He wants to mouth play with the neighbors. He can't wait to see them. He loves seeing other dogs. He wants to be able to play with the other dogs, but we're limiting that quite a lot yet. He wants to, oh, he says, hey, hey, mom, can you play a toy with me today? Can you play with a toy with me today? So we look for a, a toy that we can play with that's downsized, right, from what he used to be able to do until he has had a, his fill of that particular toy. This is how healing goes. This is how healing goes. Darby doesn't know whether he's gonna get back his full use of his legs or not. And unlike his, humans, he doesn't maybe have um, clear expectations around that. I think that he is going to get back most of it. And yes, he's going to struggle in his life with this hardware and these injuries. It's not going to be like he heals and he's never going to have pain again. That's not the way it works. But he is actually deciding, I'm going to be happy with my life now, the way it is now. Somewhere in the last four weeks, there was a shift from in his in his way of experiencing what's going on with himself to where he had enough energy, maybe you recognize this in yourself at a time, right? Enough energy to begin to sort of outward focus and start to take in and interact with the environment around him and decide, I'm gonna be happy. I can be happy with my life as it is now. I may not have the same energy that I used to have. I may not be able to go on the walks that are as long. I may not be able to go up and down the steps. I may not be able to jump, but I have claimed enough of my life back that I feel good. I'm glad to be alive. It's clear he's glad to be alive. It's been really powerful to watch. And then to reflect at the times in my life, you know, Darby lost a lot of innocence when he was hit by the car. 
actually, Larry and I lost a lot of innocence, right? This happens. Something really big happens in our life and we, we realize, oh my gosh, I'm just this really organic being. The world is this organic thing that can, a lot can happen. We had this huge event in not only a norm, hurricanes for Florida or uh, that are normal for these areas, but they're huge. They're horrible. They're, they're horrible. But then we saw an area of the country that's not very far from us, North Carolina, which we thought of as untouchable. I would, I would say the people who live in that area from talking to them pretty much thought it was untouchable in a way by climate change or by uh, any really unusual storms. This hurricane, Hurricane Helen, the aftermath of it, killed many, many people and brought that community, those communities on the mountainside down with its rains and its mudslides. And um, yeah, it's just really, it's a big loss of innocence. It's a big loss of innocence. And initially there's all this withdrawal, whether you've had a surgery or you've lost someone really important in your life, or maybe you've had something else that's really tragic or violent that has happened to you. There's all this withdrawal. And that withdrawal, of course, is necessary. We like are garnishing all of our resources inside and we need other people around us to sort of take care of us. And we, we don't even really hear the sounds. We don't even really feel the air, the environment. We're just almost, it's almost like the person's a little bit I don't want to say in a coma because you're more interactive than that, but it's a similar process where the, the, the withdrawal inside in order to be able to do the internal repair is there. And then there's this stepwise process that we uh, come through in healing. And the challenge now for Darby is now that he's ready to reclaim his life is that um, I think it's fantastic he's ready to reclaim his life. And he's ready to reconcile and make peace with his life, I think, as it is. Now, Darby has no ability to think about uh, what does it mean if I start to really learn to use my back legs inappropriately in a way that's less ideal and so that when the nerves do grow back, I will know how to use them. He doesn't know how to think about that. So that's our job to think about that, right? And human beings can think about that. So we have to come to some place in our healing where we begin to ask ourselves, am I ready to reclaim my life? Yes. Do I also need to be holding on to the possibility that if I keep engaging with myself in a, in a, uh, a way that keeps my neuroplasticity and bioplasticity plastic available to change and learn new improved ways instead of these compensatory patterns that you have to have in the short term. Can I, can I construct for myself or can we construct for Darby a scenario in which he is more likely to be able to reclaim more of himself or do we all settle? I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to this, by the way. I think people have the rights to choose this for themselves. Darby doesn't get to choose it all for himself. We get to be part of that. And of course, we're choosing to look at the options around how to help his, um, his movement patterns become stay as plastic as possible so that as the nerve regenerates, the nerves regenerate for his legs, he's able to regain as much of his function as he can. Because I know that as he ages, anything that we're not able to regain now will continue to become harder and harder and harder. So over the next year, I mean, it's gonna be a long haul because nerves come back slowly. And most big injuries for people, and an injury could be even a, a surgery like a knee replacement or hip replacement, even though those things seem like they only take a few months. They really take a couple of years. They really do take a couple of years. They really do. And then, even then, you'll still be potentially able to work with long-term compensatory patterns that you had in place, maybe even before the surgery, but certainly since the surgery that developed 
in order to make higher level improvements. Now we could talk about all of that in relationship to emotions, what we think of as emotions too. Like when I was saying this loss of innocence, that's a biggie. Loss of innocence. How are we going to work with that feeling of loss of innocence? How is how are the people of Asheville and the surrounding areas in the mountains of North Carolina going to work with that loss of innocence? And of course, they right now mostly can't think about it. They're just knuckled down to how are we going to get water? How are we going to be able to flush a toilet? Are we going to be able to have power? Uh, can I start to write the area of my home? Do I have to live somewhere else? How am I going to have food? How am I going to survive? They're in the, they're in the hunkered down state and they're trying to peek out a little bit and look around and wonder what, what else might be out there. But mostly they have to keep their resources around the issue of survival. So I don't know if this will be helpful for you, but I feel like it's been helpful to me to really watch Darby reflect back on the times in my life when something has happened to me. And actually I injured my knee trying to, to sit behind Darby in a particular way on the floor because he couldn't sit up with us. And it's a pretty significant knee injury. And, um, so there's a little right loss of innocence and there's a little, oh, withdrawing into myself and wondering, it's nothing like what happened to, to Darby and it's nothing like maybe what has happened to you. But there are always things in our lives that um, arise in different stages of our lives. Some stages and decades might even feel kind of blessed and then suddenly we have something big that happens. So I hope it's useful to you to think about the stages of healing and how, uh, how you can honor those in yourself and in other people. And then also at that really interesting juncture of when you're ready to start reclaiming your life as it is. And that's okay. And to be happy with it, that is okay. But then also maybe keeping one foot in some possibilities, one arm, one finger, one ear, whatever it is, in some possibilities for how you would um, continue to keep your system plastic available to a higher upgrade of change, not to leave your happiness behind if you don't get it, but also not to close the door on it, not to close the door on it.